where Jesus was arrested. We, we know of uh, know of his death and we know of his resurrection. We're going to focus on, focus on uh, the steps of his passion, his suffering. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try something different. Keep your Bibles open because uh, I may not get every last word right, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this from memory. Jesus just got, came back and found the disciples sleeping. He said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it, and struck it, the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I can't call on my father, and at once he will put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled? I'd say it must happen in this way. At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you've come out here with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was in the temple courts teaching, and you didn't arrest me. But this is all taking place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Valentine's Day, the exact day of Valentine's Day, and as we think about love on Valentine's Day and, and sweethearts and all that kind of stuff, I have, a, I have uh, four pictures here that people might think of when they think of love. This, especially Valentine's Day, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing we think of when we think of love, you know, cuddly stuff, romantic stuff. But what is real love that, what does the Bible say love is? And hit it, hit it one more time. This is love. This is what the Bible says love is. In 1 John, it says, God demonstrates, or no, in Romans it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Love isn't romance, it's not good feelings, it's not candy hearts, it's not cuddling, it's commitment and sacrifice and service. And if you want to follow Christ, get used to taking the hard way. If you want to love like Christ loved us, then get used to showing the kind of love that he showed. Now, the hard way, it means it's going to hurt. We're going to suffer. Now, there are inconveniences and sicknesses and, and there's death, but these, kind, these kinds of sufferings, those would come to us whether we were following Christ or not, really. We suffer these things because we live in a fallen world. Some suffering comes from a broken world or maybe our own bad choices. If I'm, if I'm doing a really bad job at, at work and I get fired, that might be because I'm just, I'm not doing well. Or if, um, if I tell a lie and I get found out about it and nobody trusts me anymore, well, that's because I told a lie. So some kinds of suffering come because we make bad choices. Sometimes it's because we live in a fallen world and, and bad things are going to happen. But Christ's suffering is what comes from doing God's will. Because Jesus ended up on that cross, not because of something that he did that was wrong, 
He ended up on the cross because what he was doing was right. And if you want to suffer with Christ, suffer for doing what is right. Because that's a whole different ballgame. Christ's suffering is what comes from doing God's will. And I'm very well convinced that comfort is the enemy of spiritual growth. The way of Christ is the way of suffering. Our ways, our, our own selfish ways, that, that, comes from, that comes from comfort. We, we seek comfort, we want to, want to relax in it, and, and we want to just kind of do, do our own thing that way, and, and that's, not, that's not the way of Christ. Comfort is what leads churches to fight about things like the color of the carpet. It's what leads us to, to not take any risks when we need to. It what leads us to be afraid that those things might be a little different. It leads us to fear change, even when change is needed. And it leads us to do what's easiest over what's best. Comfort is the enemy of spiritual growth. When we do our stretches in, in martial arts, and one of them is the splits here. I better not split my pants here. But, but when we do these stretches like this, it's supposed to be uncomfortable. And usually, I will remind students when we're doing these stretches, okay, it's got to hurt a little bit. If you're not hurting at all, then you're not getting anywhere. You just, you just look weird. <laughs> If you're, if, you're actually, if you're actually stretching your muscles, it's going to be uncomfortable. If it's not uncomfortable, you're not doing anything. So, just like an exercise in general, we need to push ourselves. It needs to be a little uncomfortable. It's the right thing to do. It's not the easy thing to do. But it's the right thing to do. If you have your Bibles, look at verse 51. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck a servant at a high priest, cutting off his ear. Okay, we know from John that this is Peter. And Peter here kind of shows what the way we, we act in when, it, when it comes to comfort versus suffering. We draw our own weapons to fight for our own ideas of God's will, thinking that God is on our side. And really, we're just fighting for our own comfort, actually. Peter is the one, the, the one of Jesus' companions that it says here. And, and Peter probably thinks he's standing up for Jesus here. Jesus is being arrested, I'm going to defend him. But Jesus already told Peter the plan of his suffering and death. And it was... Back in chapter 16, I'm going to read that here, 16, starting at 21. Jesus told Peter what the plan was. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me We'll find it. We'll stop there. Jesus is saying, hey, I, I didn't come to be a triumphant warrior here. I came to, to suffer, to, to die, and to be raised to life. This, this is God's will for me. Peter can't accept that. No, 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 that's not the way it's supposed to happen. Peter wants a Jesus with a glorious victory, with the dazzling miracles and the preaching to vast crowds, 
He wants the, the conquering warrior celebrity Jesus. That's what, that's what Peter wants. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 that's, that's the, the, the Jesus that we would want. <laughs> Peter is fighting for a Jesus of comfort when Jesus came to suffer. And we'd rather have a Jesus who's about happiness and success and lots of money and good feelings and being comfortable. That, that's the Jesus we would, would rather have. And we would even be willing to fight for that. Look at the uh, screen here with me if you would and answer the question with me. What do you understand by the word suffered? That during his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the anger of God against the sin of the whole human race. This he did in order that, by his suffering as the only atoning sacrifice, he might set us free, body and soul, from eternal condemnation and gain for us God's grace, righteousness, and eternal life. So during his whole life, especially at the end, God put all of the wrath that was ours onto Jesus Christ so that we would be free from that. In Christ alone, and we sang that a little bit ago, till on the cross that Jesus died, the, the wrath of God was, was satisfied. That, that wrath was against sin. And instead of us suffering from it, it, Christ took that punishment for us. What's fascinating to me, and I just can't get over this, Jesus enters suffering voluntarily, on purpose. The, the, this terrible suffering that, that we'll talk about in the week ahead, um, he descended even into hell. It didn't just hurt bad. He descended completely into hell. He had God's anger completely against him. We go through some really rough stuff, but he actually suffered the full punishment of sin. The full punishment. He suffered terrors and torments that we can't even imagine. And he did it willingly, voluntarily, on purpose. And he could have hit abort at any time. Imagine going through unbelievable pain and having a button right in front of you you can hit and just hit abort. I, I can't do this. I want to quit. Jesus had that button right in front of him the whole time. You want to abort this mission? Just hit the button. He could have done it. And he didn't. He says, don't you think I can't call my father and at once I'll have 12 legions of angels? Legion means 6,000. In my, in my mind, I kind of have, I kind of, my default is Legion 1,000, but really it's 6,000. A Roman legion was 6,000 troops. So Jesus could have called over 72,000 angels. More than that. 72,000. And you know, it's, it, when I was translating this, it struck me how it says legions there. It doesn't just say thousands. It says legions. Which is meant to, to point to how he could have called armies. So not just a bunch of glowing beings. Whoa, pretty beings. Look at that. No, no. Like battle-ready, fierce, fighting angelic beings. Legions was a military term. Jesus is saying, I could have armies of angels right now. He could have hit abort at any time. Those angels would have fought for him. In fact, just one angel, a few chapters later when there's the empty tomb, 
in Matthew here, just one angel made an entire Roman guard faint in fear. Those Roman guards, that wasn't just one Roman soldier standing there with a spear. No, these were, these were like Marines. These people were trained to not be afraid and to not give an inch. And the punishment for not failing to defend what you are called to defend is pretty nasty. And these guys, when they saw this angel, they fainted in fear. Just one angel. Try 72,000. Again, could have hit a fort. And it would have been done. <laughs> but he didn't. He stuck there and he got, he allowed himself to be arrested. He was not forced to die on the cross. I had a discussion one time with another pastor about how, how um, isn't, isn't God the Father punishing the Son? Isn't that like just divine child abuse? Well, okay, I'm not going to pick on all these people. I'm going to pick on my own child. I'm going to literally beat him to hell so that they'll be saved. No, it wasn't like that. The same father who willed Jesus' submission to death would have supplied angels for his escape. If you look at verse 53, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? same father who said, hey, this is, this, is, this is the plan. This is the way it's supposed to go. He would have supplied angels for his escape. This was, this was a mutually agreed upon plan in eternity somewhere. Jesus was not forced to die on the cross. He did it voluntarily because he loved us. Because that's what real love is. Commitment, to sacrifice, and service. So Jesus willingly obeys and here is arrested. He's arrested. What did he do wrong? Nothing. <clears throat> what crime did he commit? Nothing. Verse 55. Am I leading a rebellion that you've come out here with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. Why are you arresting me now? You have to come out here at night with a huge crowd and with all this being, being armed to the teeth like this? You could have arrested me any time during the day. <laughs> it's, it's almost like Jesus is saying, okay... You, you, you think your swords and your clubs is what's going to come get me? I could have 72,000 angels right here, right now. I'm going to go willingly go with you. You didn't need any arms at all. All you need is just say, hey, hey come on, I'm, we're arresting you. Okay, I would, I would have gone. But Jesus is dragged away like a violent rebel. In the time of Jesus, there were people who, basically, we would call them terrorists today. They were called zealots. And they were for the violent overthrow of Rome. And so they would do hit-and-run attacks on Romans and Jews who helped Romans. And these people were, were kind of scary people because they would kill people. They would do hit-and-run attacks, and then they'd run away. And so Jesus is saying, am I leading a rebellion here? Am I a zealot? That you have to come after me at night with a bunch of swords and clubs? I'm, I'm working out in the open here. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not attacking anybody. Nobody died. But he's dragged right away like a violent rebel. In Luke 22, verse 37, Jesus says, It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And in the Greek there, it literally says lawless. Somebody who has 
no moral compass at all. So Jesus, who is the moral compass, is treated as if he had no moral compass. Jesus was counted among the lawless. And this, this man, Jesus, who helped and healed and taught, is treated like he's a dangerous guy. They gotta go after him at night. It's like, it's like think about thinking about sending one police officer to, to make an arrest versus a SWAT team at night with night vision. I mean, they could have just sent one police officer to arrest Jesus, unarmed for that matter, and Jesus would have gone. No, they have to send in a full SWAT team with night vision, fully armed, ready to shoot, because Jesus is a dangerous guy. He's treated like he's dangerous. He does it. Jesus, Jesus goes along with this so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Two times here he says, so the scriptures would be fulfilled. Fulfilling the scripture is what's important in this passage. And when Jesus is being taken away, he's talking to him. He's like preaching him. Don't you see? Don't you see that this is nothing about you guys? This is all about fulfilling scripture here? I'm being treated as a common, a common, I'm being treated as like a terrorist. But how am I dangerous? I'm being numbered among the lawless. Just like the scripture said. Don't you see this? Don't you see why? I mean, otherwise this makes no sense at all. Why don't you just send one person to arrest me? He's preaching to them, even as they're taking him away. You kind of just said one. Well, for you and me, it takes suffering to fulfill the scriptures. If you want to do what God's will is for your life, what God's will is for you, what God wants you to do, then you're going to have to suffer. Can you do that? Some of God's commands are kind of easy, but some of them are not. We could just do the easy ones and then just kind of do whatever we want with the rest of them, but if you really want to do what God's will is for you, it's going to take some suffering. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to sacrifice some things. Because real love, if you want God's love, is dying on a cross. Can you handle that? It takes suffering to fulfill the scriptures. I want to encourage you today to be like Jesus. Choose to obey and suffer. Choose to obey and suffer. Some suffering co comes because we make bad choices. Sometimes other people make bad choices. Sometimes it just means we live in a fallen world. But suffering of Christ means you are doing what God wants you to do, and you're going to suffer for it. <coughs> so that could mean battling your internal childish demands, Facing your fears. It might mean being considered weird, being a religious freak, surrendering your time, your money, your interests. I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you an assignment today. Something to do for this coming week. This week I want you to do something that's difficult simply because it fulfills the scriptures. Think of one thing to do this week to do something that's hard. Not something that's easy. Something that's hard. Do it just to fulfill the scripture, just like Jesus did in our passage. He willingly went and was arrested. So, for example, say no to a temptation. Say no to an addiction. You want some suffering? Start saying no to your addictions. Have an uncomfortable conversation that maybe needs to be had. Do something kind to somebody you can't stand. 
give up a want to meet the need of somebody else. Or share your faith. Talk about Jesus with somebody who needs him. Or come up with something on your own. Do something difficult simply because it fulfills the scriptures. And I'll ask you next week, what, what was it that you did? All right, let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, your, your love is tough. Um, Lord, the, the love that you've shown us in, in Jesus Christ is, is, is beyond us. But Lord, we pray that by your spirit that we would start to share in those sufferings that we would become like Jesus in his death and that we would attain with him the resurrection of the dead. And that, Lord, we would seek to be your agents in this world, do your will, even if it's hard. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.